Years ago, when I was binging on sermons and things like that, I came across this guy, and I don't actually remember his name. I don't think it's really important, but I came across this guy who claimed to have been raised as a Satan worshiper, and he got to the point where he had been suicidal, or at least this is his story. This is his really, it sounds like a gimmick to me. He um, got to a point where he was suicidal, and then Jesus visited him in a vision, and he got this other chance and everything else. I'm going to tell you why I think it's a gimmick. So he became a pastor, and when he preaches, what he does is he starts calling out all the witches and warlocks in the room, and he puts high emphasis on the power of the devil. And he says things like when he was a Satan worshiper that he could transport himself into a room of Christians who were praying on Halloween, and they were the most powerful Christians. I mean, it's just like woo-woo weird stuff. And I want to tell you why I know this is a gimmick. The reason I know this is a gimmick is because Satan doesn't have any power. He has power only as it's given to him by God. You know, even a lot of the times when I'm, when I'm talking, I'll say that Satan only has the power that you give him. And truly, you don't have any power, so you're not technically giving him any power. It would be more accurate for me to say that you're giving him permission and that you are giving away any power that you could have had through Christ, through being in him, through being in the name, through being used by him. And so you know that there's this battle that's going on in your, in your flesh, right? In your soul, that your flesh wants to take over, your flesh wants control, your flesh wants glory and greed and all of these other things. Satan tempts your flesh because the only power that he can invoke is through rights and permissions. That's the reason he's called the accuser of the brethren. That's the reason he stands before God night and day trying to invoke his legal rights. Well, she did this. Well, she thought this. Well, she did this, even though you told her not to. So now I get to take her soul. So now I get to attack her. And so the way that you break that is that you return to God and then he returns to you. Now, what does it mean to return to him? It means to rend your heart. It means to remove all idols, to examine how that spirit of Satan got in you to begin with. What was it? that allowed him to get in, and then you've got to learn from that. But it doesn't mean that you start placing your focus on him. And so one of these tricks, these schemes of the devil in counterfeit Christianity is to cause you to place your focus on the devil as though he has some power. Well, he doesn't have any power. He has to stand before God, doesn't he? He has to stand before God like a little lame and say, well, she did this. So can I have permission to attack her? I mean, how pathetic is that? And so I'm always comparing Satan to what the world refers to as a narcissist because we're pretty familiar with that. Unfortunately, we're more familiar with a diagnosis, a fake diagnosis of the world than we are about what God says about the spiritual condition. So I'm having to use that in order to help you understand the spiritual condition. So you probably are aware that what the world calls a narcissist, that they have a very fragile ego is what the world says. Basically, they're a twit. They impose harsh standards and burdens of morality onto you, but they have none for themselves. And so that's what he's doing. He's nitpicking every single thing that you do in order to invoke legal rights to do what he wants to do. And also in order to convince himself that he has some sort of power, that he is God, that he can be God, that he can covet what is God's. And frankly, he can't. He's doomed to his destruction. So anything that he's working so hard to do right now, he doesn't even get to keep. So to go into a a church, not the church, a church and start calling out warlocks and witches, like what's the point of that? What is the point of doing that? What is the point of us when we experience an attack, which is an attack by the devil. He definitely attacks us. But when we experience that attack, what is the, what is the point of us going, ah, I'm being attacked. Satan is here. What's the point of that? To place focus on the devil, to feed into him. And so when you're doing that, I want you to understand very clearly why it is that the devil attempts to get you to place focus on him. Because when you're focused on him, you're not focused on God. 
You're not focused on your responsibility. You think that he has more power than God. And that is absolutely the way that counterfeit Christianity teaches you to regard the devil is to think that he has more power than God. And it's so destructive to you because you can't do anything. You can't scream the devil away. That isn't a thing. Understand the way that he got permission to attack you in the first place. It was because of something that you did. And so if it was because of something that you did that allowed him to get permission from God to attack you, then what needs to happen in order for him to no longer have permission to attack you? You see the trick? So if, you're, if you continue to focus on him, then you're going to do crazy things that counterfeit Christianity teaches you to do, like trying to scream out a spirit, screaming that you rebuke that spirit without ever realizing that your personal accountability will invoke the power of God. That's where your power is because you don't have any other power. I mean, do you have power in your voice to say, I rebuke you, Satan? So as you're going through, you know, this day, this day of Halloween, this day that is lifted up to the useless false god of Satan, you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to sit there and think, oh my goodness, all of these curses and sacrifices and you know, prayers to Satan are being lifted up right now. What am I going to do? We're in danger. No, you're not. It's a joke. He's a joke. There's no power in it. Your power is in God. He is the only one who has power. The only way that you invoke protection and power is through him. Let me tell you, this day of Halloween invokes God's jealous wrath. It incites God's jealous wrath. It incites his anger. You think about what's happening today, getting children in the spirit by sugaring them up. That is a witchcraft practice in order to make us vulnerable. It is a widely accepted drug to make us vulnerable. You know that as well as I do. I mean, we don't give our children a bunch of sugar because we don't want to have to deal with the crazy consequences of that. We know that it's not good for them. We know that their personalities change, that they become moody when they're coming down from it, that they're out of their mind when they're on it. These are the things that we need to be aware of, that we need to be understanding that when we start doing these things, we're handing over permission for us to be attacked. And it makes us vulnerable when we start sugaring ourselves up on that drug. Literally, the language that is used is to put one in the spirit. That is the witchcraft language. Now, does that give power to the devil? Your decisions can give power to the devil. Your decisions to dress your children up as demons and glorify death and bring them into a haunted house and sugar them up and teach them to observe a holiday, not a holy day, a holiday lifted up to Satan to the enemy of God, what do you think that's going to invoke? What do you think it's going to incite with God? And I know this is difficult. You know, this was one of our favorite holidays when I was raising my child. Both of our birthdays are around this time. We always did a haunted house at our house and a party. We decorated. It was kind of a hard thing to let go of. And some of the questions that we ask around this, especially with, you know, me having a grandchild on the way is what about the rest of the family? What about the rest of the world? What about them? If they don't understand, they've not been given understanding. We have to teach our children not to be of this world, not to be connected to the things that this world does, the things that they are attached to, the things that we once were attached to. We understand because we were once attached to it, but just because we empathize does not mean that we justify does not mean that we join and does not mean that we forsake our responsibility to walk in the authority as a parent, as a grandparent, as a mentor, whatever position you're in, to teach correctly, to lead correctly, and to set an example. We're going to have to learn how to enjoy these different seasons that God has, the fall harvest, the spring harvest, the summer harvest. We're going to have to learn how to enjoy those things and celebrate those things the way that we did in the world. 
And a lot of us grieve and mourn. Oh, I'm not going to celebrate Christmas. I'm not going to celebrate Halloween. I'm not going to be doing St. Patrick's Day or Valentine's Day or Easter. How am I going to raise my children? Figure it out and figure it out with God. He has a way of doing that. He wants to give you understanding and he wants you to enjoy correct rejoicing. Correct rejoicing is not sugaring yourself up and getting under in the spirit. Correct rejoicing has to do with understanding, understanding where you're going to be in eternity, not being invested in what you're doing right now to be a part of the world. Shut your doors, isolate yourselves, rid your house of yeast. Take a lesson from Passover tonight. Do not participate in what the world is doing, not because Satan has any power, but because your decisions have power, not because witches and warlocks curses and sacrifices, not because any of that means anything, not because Satan has any power. He's puny. He's a puny little twit. He's a burning stick in the fire. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video.